Hello friends, welcome back to the channel and thank you for joining me for part two of my interview with Jake Cooper. Part one where he shared his near-death experience story will be linked in the description. Today we're going to get into a Q&A and I do want to offer a trigger warning because Jake is not just a near-death experiencer but also a therapist. I felt comfortable asking him a question that I've never asked anybody else prior, but it is one that I get a lot in the comments related to suicide and the near-death experience. So if that topic is triggering to you, here is the timestamp where we begin talking about it. Don't forget to check out the description for Jake's links to his website, Facebook, social media, and his book, Life After Breath. Thank you for watching. Here's Jake. What are some of the lessons for these current times that you can share with us about the other side. I think we have to have a whole other show with that because there's so much, you know, <laughs> suffering out there, you know, and there's so much pain and so much loss and grief, yeah. um, you know, and, and just, just people forgetting who they are. I, I think, you know, the important part is, you know, I think the good part about this last year or two was it had the potential to expedite the impermanence of the soul. Uh, I'm not of the soul, <laughs> excuse me, of the body. Our good, now you're going to see Vanity Fair quoted me that near-death experiencer said that there's impermanence of the soul, right? <laughs> impermanence of the body. But, you know, um, and that to me was a, a big game changer when I had my near-death experience, knowing the fragility of the body, knowing the fragility of this life as we know it, which just any second that could be taken. And I think in the last you know, couple of years, that's been really broadcasted to, to many. Uh, and that really isn't anything new. You know, this body is finite in nature, but sometimes we just cruise and forget that and, you know, play the conveyor belt in, in this game. And so we can engage with that with, you know, either ways we could have fear with that, or we could allow that to really allow a lot more mindfulness, a lot more purpose, and a lot more ways to beat our own drum and to really live out who we truly are and what's inside of us. And I think the most important part is for people to be empowered during this time. Our lives have been quite disempowered from almost day one. When you think about it, we were physically dependent, you know, on parents and that led to ideological dependency, you know, with adults. And we were, we, many times we just put away our own truths, you know, in, in others' hands. And, you know, there was a synonymous confusion with the old age of our soul, with the, with the youth of our you know, development in our body. And so I think really it's, it's, it's letting that go and recognize that the love inside of us, the love around us and the intelligence inside of us, intelligence you know, around us is so infinitely expansive and it could really guide us through these challenges so that we don't directly go at it, but we could go through it, you know, very skillfully and just kind of like be like water, like Bruce Lee would talk about, just, mm -hmm. you know, have an inner flow. And so I think if we're able to live from the inside out and be on this earth, but not of this earth, you know, we could really have a proper foundation, you know, to really transform, um, you know, this time, which trans is meaning ch changing shape. Trans is, is, you know, is to change and form is, is, is form. And I think we have the ability to transform this planet from coming from a solid foundation. I think part of the issue is the weak foundation and people are getting caught up in living outside in versus inside out. And, you know, they're, they're not, um, you know, properly anchored in their own inner being. Yeah, then that's the journey, isn't it? To become yeah. anchored within. Yeah, and I think really the world is so much of a reflection of what we connect to. And the more of this stuff that we connect to on a deep inner level, you know, the more that we connect to with others. And I think also the finite of the body is, is helpful to understand the finite of this whole apparatus that we're on, where there's a lot of attachment, obviously, you know, and I'm not, you know, just endorsing minimalism or going at materialism. I think that has its time and place for, for different levels, but it's also important to, to look at it and to remember its nature that, you know, behind a, a hearse, you cannot take a U-Haul. I mean, you can, if you want to get back at your family members, but in general, you can't, you know, so that, that this is very temporary. And, and so where do we want to put our energies? Do we want to put it towards egocentric self-serving ways or do we want to leave this planet better than behind when we left it and to have a ripple effect and you know that that's really behind the work that I do each and every day it's 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 just finding different ways to create that ripple effect and that's all of to me the most closest to the collateral that we could have within our lifetimes is 
you know, how we're able to really speak out beauty and how, what octave do we have in this universe, which means uni is one and verse means song. And what was our octave? What was our song? What was our message, you know, to the, to, to the world in this lifetime? So you are a hypnotherapist, correct? And you specialize in past life regression. And I'm curious um, how your near-death experience influenced you to go down that path and and what do you do with that? Yeah, you know, after having my near-death experience and I talk a little bit about this in Life After Breath, trauma allowed me, I do believe, to hold on to it and have such clear recollection of it. You know, but the other side of it, was it was very it made for a very complicated childhood where this apparatus that I was on I was just taken off of it and I was just asked to like play the game and you know and it's just almost kind of like I was remembering that this was just an act I was just putting on a suit on this play of life and I was just I wasn't attached to it as much and so you know and obviously the suffocating part to my brain allowed my brain to have a lot more of a clearer light coming through it and so I was able to go in between two worlds very easily from the filter of my own life or what we call the brain was very much open. And so from that, I had a lot of recollection of between lives, you know, past lives and was able to cross over very, very easily. And a lot of it was pretty overwhelming for a young kid to just be in the middle of nowhere and have all these downloads, you know, happen to me. Uh, But I understood that hypnosis works very similar to the near-death experience without the traumatic um, without the traumatic experience of suffocation in a sense that it works with the filter of the brain. It allows the brain to get into the deeper re- states of relaxation so that you know, your higher subconscious could be open and it could be more uh, readily accessible you know, to hide in memories and experiences. And if you do believe that consciousness is not produced by the brain, but rather filtered through it, you know, then we're really tapping into something different. And um, I think from allowing the brain to really be in a relaxed state and, and, and open, really allow ourselves to connect to a collective, you know, consciousness and to open ourselves up. And so it's my way of empowering people to have what I had minus the trauma of it. And I think past life regression is great because it's almost intimacy with eternity. You go through many lifetimes with the regressions and just understand that there's a continuity there, 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 there's a continual, you know, sequence of our lifetimes. And, you know, we, we move on from different lifetimes, different lessons and gifts, but it's just a knowing of eternity from, you know, a, a regression, which is so much of a more skillful and less traumatic experience that I had from suffocating and losing my breath and having to deal with that trauma for my whole life. And uh, I, I think I also did it because I think People are looking for the life's purpose. They want to know that they're more than just paying the bills and, you know, all these other things. And they're wanting to remember why they came here or why, you know, they're, they're guessing themselves and they want to really connect to an intelligence far greater than their own to allow themselves to trust and knowing that they're here for a purpose. And um, it's to empower people because I think from talking about my near-death experience or past life, you know, regression, my goal is to empower people that this isn't something that I own, but this is something that we're all a part of. And if I'm known as the afterlife guy, the near to the experience guy, I won't be very happy because I want people to know that in themselves. You know, I'm just a mirror for who they are and what, what they're connected to, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So you mentioned earlier on in our talk about soul families and that there might be something more you would like to yeah. share about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I connect to my own level when I get very relaxed to my own guides, even though their exact shapes and names. I, sometimes I, I don't get as clear as my near-death experience would be, which would be almost impossible, you know, you know, in some ways. I could go back to it in memory the same way, but to connect to it exactly how it happened, I wouldn't be here. I would be over there. But, you know, I do get readings time to time because I do think when you lose a loved one, we could connect in our own way, but sometimes it's good for validation to have that interdimensional communication with, uh, you know, a, a tested, effective, you know, you know, you know, medium. And so I, I went to a medium one time and she was connecting to one of my aunts who was one of my mentors later in life. And she got me back on this, you know, kind of quest of, of inner journey, you know, my later teens, early twenties. Uh, but she came through in the reading and 
and her deathbed, she had, you know, what's called deathbed visions, which is very common for people, you know, going through, you know, their last couple of days. And she, one of the messages that she last left with me was, you know, the power of a soul family and how there's an interconnectedness behind a soul family. And how, if you look at a family portrait, either know some people might look individually different than others. There's a under, there's a tremendous connection that goes far beyond this lifetime. And I thought it was a cool message, but I just kind of put in the filing cabinet. I'm like, all right, you know, and she was talking about how when she was crossing over, obviously she was sensing the hands of her loved ones on the other side and you know, that she was talking to them and, you know, which is, you know, really cool too, you know, in common for people to have that deathbed visitation. But, um, you know, a couple of years later, a medium was connecting to her and actually she just, the same medium who connected to her passed away a year ago from yesterday. So there's so much synchronicities happening, but she connected her and she was really clear, making clear contact. And she just said, why is your aunt saying the word picture over and over again? What does that mean? And I just knew that that picture was her way of talking about the chain and this, this undeniable soul family of her last message. And, you know, to me, that just gave me a knowing and, and, and evidence of this pure, of this message. And, you know, I look at messages from loved ones as building a case of an eternity, kind of like a lawyer goes up to a judge and builds up different cases for a particular case. You know, the same thing with, with this. And I thought that was a great message of eternity, but also of the undeniable connectivity and message of soul family, how we're so much more than what we think. And there's lifetimes that we connect to, and there's a ray of God that, that is expressed by the soul family in, in a different, you know, expression, different style and, you know, in different, you know, and similar kind of lessons and themes that unite that particular soul group together, if that makes sense. How yeah. it's, it's a team effort, not just so much an individual effort, if that makes sense too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you think that we sometimes incarnate with these people to? With, with that, with it, without question or doubt, I mean, you know, and, and not just people biologically, we're not just limited by biological means. Mm. I, I think soul family goes beyond just our biological nuclear family. You know, I think we get very caught up in terminology and this is this, that, and that, it get very like territorial. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's important to just find ways to understand that if you're feeling you are with someone and just know that there's just, no matter what you do, you're always connected to them. Even if you try, you're just, they always just find a way to come back to you. There's, there's something to it. And we grew up with friends in high school or college, but then there's always the ones that just stick out. And always come back to us and they're just kind of like beyond the fray and there's just something different and I, I think that's also it too or some that you meet and you've never met before and I just there's a knowing that I know you and I think all souls know each other but there's there's uh, less amnesia of that particular soul and there's just a there's a stronger connection of souls so absolutely yeah, yeah that's so comforting at least to me so, Jake, why don't you share about your book, what caused you to write it, and what people can expect from it, and yeah, where they can get a copy of it. Yeah, you know, um, my my motive was so many different things in writing Life After Breath, but one of them was, as a kid, I just loved going to libraries, and in my later teens, I started reading self-help books, and I just, when I was in the energy of an author's, you know, page, whether that was a Marion Williams, you know, Tony Robbins, and I saw their face smiling, I just said, I want to live on those shelves. I want to die in those mm -hmm. shelves. I want my name to be on those shelves one day. And whenever I was going through a dark moment, I would always pick up that book on a cold winter's night and it would just give me life. And my near-death experience I saw was allegorical for what I experienced from books, which, which was when I felt totally suffocated and lifeless, there was an infused eternity of life that I connected to. And in Judaism, we call that Ruach or the wind of God, which is what we're breathed with, the breath of eternity, the breath of our essence. And from losing the breath of my body, I was breathed in that whole new breath. And, you know, that really was the inspiration behind the title of Life After Breath. I wanted to give people a breath of life that, that was there when that was very much deprived in the world. And there were so many symbologies of that from the last year or two, from, you know, medical basis to emotional basis. But the common theme was people just felt like, the life force that they were connected to was cut off. And so my hope is that this book gives a jolt of inspiration. It gives a recollection 
you know, that we come from this beautiful place. We go to this beautiful place. We're always connected to it and no pain, no suffering could ever take us. It's just temporary. It's, it's, it's turbulence, but it's not eternal. No storm ever lasts forever. And we come back to this, to this beautiful place and we don't have to wait till we die to get to heaven. We cultivate it in everyday lives. And so life after breath is my first book, you know, that I wrote, I'm currently finishing up my next book. And, uh, you know, this book, I really got very much personal and I did that because after going through a lot of the near death experience talks, a lot of people felt a very uh, much alone or that I came from a very much of a privileged place. And so I, I very much, my goal was for people to find themselves in this experience and to really ground the experience so that people could be empowered with the known spirituality and empowered with their connectivity to spirit in the afterlife, that it was something that wasn't monopolized by near-death experiencer, but it was there to allow people to remember, and that's our job. So that was a bit of my hope with the book, and I hope people could come back with that invigoration of life after within the book. Wonderful, and I will have the book linked in the description for anyone interested. Do you have any other projects that you'd like to share? Anything else going on? Yeah, you know, um, I, I work very closely with, with a lot of marginalized populations because you know, I do recognize from my years in this book, it's like, it seems like I'm seeing the same particular client in the same particular venue. We're not rolling up our sleeves enough to do this. And so, you know, I am going to be working a lot more with aged population and you know, doing some stuff with developmental disabilities as well, too, within some of my work. And you know, I think it's very much important to... Um, not just be pigeonholed in one particular client. I think everyone's important. And so for myself, I'm, I'm working on a couple of different projects with a couple of different, you know, marginalized populations. Uh, you know, and this past summer was one of my greatest events where I presented at the Forever Family Foundation, which, you know, if you're not familiar with, it's, 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 it's a group that works with, you know, loved ones who have lost, you know, people, you know, in their lives. And it's a grief support group but it works on a scientific basis and they have evidentially tested mediums. And I was the first ever near-death experiencer to present there. And what I love about it was people came up to me and they're like, well, we love our messages from the mediums, but this was so much more expansive. And so I guess my goal is to just utilize this as, a, as, as an option for people going through grief and to present with different grief groups, um, you know, and different you know, uh, programs. But I, I guess my biggest project is try to finish up my second book which is a lot of the lessons from the other side uh, extracted in a book. And, you know, I'm, I'm fiddling, fiddling with, the, with the title, but the, but the name I think is The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. Uh, because, you know, my name is Jacob and you think of Jacob from the Bible and he had the dream of the angels going up and down the ladder. And I had that in the playground and there's so much in the name. And, you know, I had my near-death experience in a playground and just reminded me how we're all just children of God playing in God's playground here to really nurture and care for each other and to mm. be our, each other's keepers and so many lessons from it and so you know my next book I really wanted you know different lessons so that we don't have to wait till we die to get there we could integrate you know that intelligence and awareness in everyday life this is a heavy question it's if you're uncomfortable with it just let me know okay um, I can edit it I'm out. a New Yorker we could take a shot to the chin <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that in a past life that you remembered committing suicide, ending your own life. And being someone who interviews near-death experiences, near-death experiencers and talks a lot about the other side, I get a lot of questions from people about, I would just much rather be there. And if there's no judgment over there, then what's the harm in just skipping out early? And I'm never sure how, I never really want to answer these myself because it's so hard for me to know what to say because on the one hand, I want to comfort people who have been through that with a loved one. But on the other hand, I don't want to encourage anyone in that direction. So do you have any anything to say to those people who might be thinking along those lines? Yes, absolutely. It's a question I'm, I'm asked all the time. I don't necessarily know if my answer will satisfy every inquiry, but I could go with my own experience and that's what I go by. And from having that lifetime, which I committed suicide, it wasn't like, like you said, I wasn't condemned or anything like that. 
but from completion, you begin. So when you feel like you're ending something, you know, it's temporary, but you still in your own way at some point go through that experience. And I think when you're there, you work very closely on the other side, you know, with those who have lost loved ones, you continue that. But I think within this earth lifetime, there's a different way to understand that. And so from completion, we begin. And, you know, so from a personal basis, I work with that you know, population mm-hmm. as a, in, within the mental health field. And I didn't even think about that in doing that. That wasn't even a part of it. But again, that's a part of, and it's not a punishment, but it's just a way to find healing. And I think from that vantage point, you're able to really have a further understanding, you know, but I think it's very important to understand that no matter what happens, you always have that chessboard piece to make. It might come through in different shapes, different ways, you know, it, it, you know, and it gets alleviated at times and it's a case by case situation. I can't speak for all, but generally from completion, we begin. And I think in our own way, it's learning that same playbook where trust and have a knowingness and have an awareness to what is inside of us is infinitely greater than what's in front of us. And, you know, it, it, it's choice, you know, you can't take away choice, but either way, you know, it's like, would you rather work, you know, work, do it now, or just put it off for later. And either way, you're going to get the work done. So it's just a matter of like choice in, in a way, but isn't it better? You work this hard, you came this far, you know, why not see it through? And that was one of the just regrets that I had in committing suicide, where I just saw in that moment that I felt incredibly stuck, but I also saw that I would have been able to got to go through that, and I would have been that much more stronger. And the number one regret of the majority of people who commit suicide, uh, who have, sorry, have a suicide, you wouldn't have a regret, it, but who have an attempt, is that they did it, and that they just knew that they were so much more loved than they could ever think of, and they were very stuck in this. And so I, it, it's a choice. I don't pass judgment. I just lost my best friend to it a couple of weeks ago. And I was there with him each and every day. And uh, it's not, it's something that we try to, you know, be proactive about and help people with, you know, but, but at the same time, I think it's, it, I always just believe in, you know, doing it now versus later, you know, and, and facing that because when you're sticking with it, you will get stronger. You will get more evolved. You will be able to handle it. And, you know, I don't think there's ever been almost anything that wasn't able to have some progress in some way, in some fashion. And it wasn't what you were facing that changed. It was how we engaged with it. And I think the good news is we have so much more resources at hand, so much more support system to be able to, to handle this and that you don't have to do it alone. You never did it alone. And it's my hope that here in near-death experience uh, you know, discussions, um, in, in different case studies that we just have a firm understanding of how small we see ourselves as in our situations as and how much more we are loved and surrounded by love that we could ever imagine. And I think so much of this lifetime is remembering who we truly are, what we're connected to, to allow us to go through these different experiences in this human life. So I think a lot of people get attached to their ego and their experiences over their true nature. I think if you're able to remember who you are, it doesn't change the events, but it changes the engagement. I hope in some way that that moves the needle to some degree. It is, it is a very difficult question and a lot and a lot more time is, is needed for that. Uh, but I, I just think in a way being there doing that, if I were to live life from the end and look at that moment, I would just say tr- trust in the infinite intelligence over my own uh, limited awareness in that moment. And to trust that whatever we're going through, storms are not made to, to break us, but they're to make us in a way. And it's something that we're here to go through. And we could look at life through many different lens. We could look at it through the victimized standpoint, or we could look at it through the growth, growth oriented mind standpoint. You know, in either way, it's the events of the events and how we engage with them really defines the events. And, and so life is very much about how we perceive it and the pathways and the angles that we take between the stimuli and our own response, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that question. Yeah, I, I hope that makes sense to viewers and to you to some degree. Um, yes. You know, you know, being there firsthand, just you know, knowing that we're very limited in what we see in our own suffering and what we going through that, we just don't recognize how much more we grow 
you know, from that experience. And I do believe we go through experiences, not just for our own self, but to have a greater understanding and awareness of what other people go through. And it's not just for ourselves, mm -hmm. but for ourselves to be able to guide and to work with through people, through other experiences. And I, so I think if we do incorporate, I think the greatest part of suffering is isolation. And if we're able to understand the purpose behind our own pain, we're able to really look at it through a whole different angle that it's not just about us, but we're here to you know, evolve that experience and to, to assist someone through, through going through that period. Is there any final words that you would like to share before we go? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's also um, important to understand the great attractor of life that we are. Um, you know, so many times we are upset with our lives because we just focus on the things that we don't want and we get those things, you know, back to us. And I think I looked at the other side as the ultimate place of abundance and you're connected to that inner place infinite possibilities are there in front of you. Uh, but I think in a way we've taught to like turn on our blinders. And even if it is exactly what we want, we chop it down because it's never enough. And, and so I think if we recognize that we are enough just as we are, and we're here to just express that infinite abundance in our lives, our whole lives change. And, you know, I think some people they'll live their lives based off of, you know, um, a checklist of events. And if these events go well, then I'll feel happy. Uh, and rec not recognizing that joy and happiness isn't found outside of us, but rather within. It's just, you know, a way to express us on the outside. And I think that's so much what I learned where um, in any particular situation, any season, you could find what you're looking for. And I think some of the, you know, historical figures have been able to stand by those same ideologies and people have changed the world. They lived from really connecting to this deep place within and they weren't defined by their set of circumstances. I mean, I know someone by the name of Victor E. Frankel who wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning was in you know, one of the abyss of you know, humanity's uh, existence in the Holocaust. And he wrote you know, this great book, but he found the most freedom when every freedom was taken away from him being a, you know, a prisoner in the concentration camp. And uh, I think if he could find that, so too we could find that in our own situation. The playbook is there. And I think what's important is for people to learn how to really connect to this part of themselves that they know can never be taken from, uh, from you. And I find that, you know, when I lead meditation groups, people come out and usually touch a part of themselves that's greater than their outside situation, more than their thoughts, more than their mind. And there's just this eternal part that they connect to. And I think when you connect to eternity, you recognize, you know, that there's just only life. There is no death. You know, there's only life you know, life will breed itself. And there's, there's a continuity of it. Um, and so hopefully from hearing this encounter, I know the term near death experience has that term of death, but I think really this, this experience is totally antithetical to anything of death. It's looking at death square in the face and recognizing through suffering, through pain, all that could feel very real and experience, but it returns back to the nothingness and all that is left is eternity at the end of the day. And remembering that could allow us to engage with different, you know, finite, difficult experiences within our everyday lives. Thank you so much for being willing to do this interview and to share your wisdom and your experiences with us. By God's grace alone, thank you so much for having me. 